Welcome to Jack Korea 2021 Technical Conference, focusing on the latest development in high-performance composite technologies and applications. The theme have been selected to answer the composite's key actors' needs. My name is Ji Hye Song, and I'm given the honor of being an MC for the conference. Today, as the last day of the conference, we invite decision makers and key actors from the composite industry to present their latest information, trends, and experiences. To begin this conference, and I would like to introduce our first speaker, keynote speaker, Mark Gouldov, Associate Professor at MIT, Department of Architecture, was supposed to join us today online, but however, since he is bereaved of his father, we replace his presentation to the video that includes many of the Carbon House scientists. We send our sincere condolences to his family. Then, let us watch the video right away. So, so for Venice, I thought of the celebrated Powers of Ten movie by the Eames from the 1970s, uh, which zooms out to the limits of outer space and then zooms in to the atoms in your body as if announcing that uh, architectural imagination could now think these, uh, these powers of 10, these, these different scales. And it's occurred to me with this Carbon House project that we're now being called upon to, to act at all those scales. So the, the billion year evolution of the planet, uh, where, whereby bioorganisms you know, inexorably absorb carbon out of the, the atmosphere to establish the oxygen carbon conditions necessary for the emergence of, uh, of higher forms of life. Uh, now, you know, the billion ton hydrocarbon market uh, effectively oxidizing that, that, that bio legacy and putting it back into the atmosphere as, as carbon dioxide uh, somewhat perilously uh, to the, the scale of, of, of population from uh, 7 to 11 billion people uh, on the planet by end of century. Uh, and then, you know, thinking, well, what might one do alternatively with that, that, that bio uh, legacy, and, and therefore thinking down to, to the native forms of carbon, to, to, to graphene, to, um, uh, to carbon nanotube, which are you know, a billionth of a meter in scale, but you need to understand those morphologies to understand how this material might be deployed, you know, structurally, thermally, electrically, in service of habitation. Um, so working with, with uh, research scientists, particularly the you know, carbon nanotube, but particularly the uh, pyrolysis scientists has been fascinating because it, it gives a glimpse of, of a, a wholly available uh, material paradigm which could be brought forward at a, at a moment of critical population growth and uh, stringent you know, environmental concern uh, to, to offer you know, effectively a, uh, a carbon ontology where we use that, that, that um, hydrocarbon legacy wisely um, at a very, you know, very perilous time for humanity. It, it's really the sheer scale that is daunting. Uh, a predicted doubling of buildings on the planet by 2050. So the, la the last 5,000 years of buildings, but this time in, in 30 years. So said otherwise, a, a million homes per week from now till 2050. I mean, the scale is just, just absolutely staggering. And it seems to us that just the embodied energy of the materials we're using is already uh, going to put a, a vast cloud of CO2 into the atmosphere if we continue building with steel, cement, aluminum, gypsum, you know, copper, these high energy intensity and high mass materials. Um, but what alternative is there in, this, in the time frame available? There's no evident you know, source of, of grown materials. Forest takes 25 years and is 
is tiny in comparison to the, the tonnage of, um, of steel and cement. The only alternative material paradigm really is the hydrocarbons, which already you know, oil and gas exceed steel and cement by tonnage, if you can imagine that. And, uh, and coal exceeds uh, the, whole, the whole building sector. So, so this is a, a call to uh, take seriously the prospect of, of using the hydrocarbons, not as fuels, uh, far from it, uh, instead as building materials, but, but where we can to pyrolyze things like methane to produce hydrogen as a clean fuel, and then use the, uh, the carbon that is, is left to, to build you know, elegant, lightweight, thin skin, uh, energy efficient buildings. Uh, at civilizational scale, at the scale of, of energy markets. So the beauty of the process is methane is 75% carbon and 25% hydrogen by mass. And so you take the primary mass component, the carbon, you make it into a material. But if you look at methane as a source of energy, you realize that about two thirds of the energy of the methane is in the hydrogen. And so you're going to take that hydrogen and use it for energy. And so it turns out that it works really well. You get the principal mass component, you use it for materials, you get the principal energy component, the hydrogen, and you use it for energy. First of all, all the carbon ends up in the solid and you, therefore there's no emissions. The second benefit is you get hydrogen and that hydrogen, when it's used for energy, has no emissions either. So you can displace uh, other fuels. But the third aspect, which I think is the most important, is that that carbon material is now going to displace major offenders in terms of CO2 emissions and in terms of mining. Every time you displace a ton of steel, that means that you don't have to emit two tons of carbon dioxide. If you displace a ton of aluminum, you're putting out of business 12 tons of carbon dioxide and also the mining that is uh, taking place to get aluminum oxide. The beauty of carbon additives is that uh, they're very stable, but they're also recyclable. You can put them back in the solvent, you can process them again, and essentially you get the same properties in the final material. Certainly, this technology is not going to be limited by resources. Even if we converted all the natural gas we produced now into carbon nanotubes and hydrogen, we have enough reserves to go for hundreds of years. And every year, more and more reserves are getting discovered. We're not running out of carbon. We ran out of the capacity of our atmosphere to accept the waste that we make when we turn the carbon into the CO2. For this to have an impact uh, on climate and on how we make materials and we use them, it's critical that these materials will become accessible to be used uh, in the building industry. The building industry is the biggest user of materials in the world. This is exactly where we are right now. These materials are not just stronger than steel, more thermally conductive aluminum, etc., and lighter. They are just different. They behave like textiles. And so it's key to work with architects uh, who have uh, the creativity, the imagination, but also the ability to reduce to practice uh, these new designs where the material properties will shine. The promise of vast reduction of mass at civilizational scale makes this carbon nanotube technology very compelling. I met the uh, buoyant and optimistic Dave Galas, a research scientist at Nanocom, who claimed he could convert methane into high quality carbon nanotube and hydrogen in less than a meter. Benignly, no external energy. And so I said to him, could you do that at civilizational scale? Could you build every house in the world with that? 
and he said he thought he probably could. We were working with uh, different forms of uh, hydrocarbons. It stumbled onto methane as a very efficient way to produce uh, structural carbon for spacecraft. We produce in the pilot, in the, even in the small pilot reactors, um, enough nanotubes if lined up uh, to reach the sun uh, every second. So 93 million miles a second would be a typical number. We, we produce quadrillions per second. So we end up producing something that ends up like a macro material that we can harvest directly from a gas phase reaction. Individual tubes have spectacular properties. They are known to be the strongest and stiffest material uh, ever identified. Uh, however, when we grow them in large quantities, the challenge is to take, take them, align them, organize them, densify them so you can have uh, structural objects at the macro scale. We've demonstrated uh, high conversion efficiencies up to 85%. We've demonstrated the product, positive production of hydrogen as expected. Uh, we produce materials that have structural properties of interest uh, for construction applications and beyond. Um, these are produced for both mechanical applications and electrical applications since they're good conductors. The, our, our next challenges are to validate concepts we need to scale. And we've just taken a big step forward by a demonstration reactor that increased our capacity by roughly a factor of 10 per reactor. Nature itself actually produces very stable carbon. About uh, a large portion of the carbon in the universe is actually in similar structures from, from space exploration. The engineers and scientists here are fascinated by the process. It's in, in some ways elegant and simple, in some ways extremely complex and hard to probe. Things happen very quickly and uh, are, are very sensitive. But when the process runs, well, it, uh, it's elegant to watch uh, a gas phase material turn into a structural material in seconds. We typically work with scientists and engineers, and architects have uh, offered up some in interesting benefits. One, one is they think on a longer term time horizon. Uh, in particular, this project, looking at kind of civilization scale projects, looking at the center of the century, you know, mid century uh, issues. Um, but it also brings into mind uh, affordability, uh, manufacturing uh, considerations where in a lot of our work uh, in, in spacecraft, those are, those are minor considerations, right? Uh, the challenges of cost relate to, to, to different factors, whereas construction, building, and the challenges architects find uh, are a lot, a lot of them related to labor costs, uh, transport, site, and waste. And uh, those are interesting and new issues for us. Over billions of years, the small bioorganisms drew carbon out of the atmosphere, establishing a balance with oxygen to permit the higher forms of life to evolve. In this critical period where we are putting carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, a technology such as this seems very promising in leaving the carbon in solid form and making it available for civilizational scale construction. The composites finer element structural engineer Radek Mikulik in Poland has a very simple idea which is to render the, the complex engineering of fiber-based structures simple through computation and deliver it to, to anyone, anywhere, via the cloud. Carbon fiber based materials offer remarkable benefits over steel and other construction materials. Carbon fiber composite could deliver five times the stiffness and up to 12 times more strength per same unit mass. This translates to much lighter building structure or greater spans and higher buildings. Carbon nanotube based materials have been gaining structural performance year by year. We anticipate greater spans 
and liberation from structural grid in the lightweight monocoque structural logic of future buildings. Its anisotropy and better specific properties gives true advantage over traditional materials like steel and concrete. While studying small composite houses, we learned that loads are relatively low. Building structures is light, life loads are predominant. Basic structural panels handle it, except maybe a few areas where, say, in the way of windows, corners, or around supports, the internal loads intensity increases. Composites allow to address this by optimizing local material properties, by modifying layups, composition, or adjusting fiber orientation. This allows to deliver very efficient and optimized building structure, even for the small buildings. Composite buildings structural mass reduces. As a consequence, life load greatly exceeds dead loads. This imposes a fundamental change in the nature of loading and the way buildings could be designed. Studying composite condominiums, we found that stiffness of buildings and its components is a driver. For some designs, however, also compressive loads on low-level walls and at the supports could be a prime challenge. This is, however, well within the capacity of carbon composite materials or within the anticipated CNT-based composite materials performance. Composites offer ultra-light weighing of buildings, seamless, fewer part buildings envelopes, with improved integrity of structure and systems. With higher specific properties, these materials deliver more for the same unit mass. Together with new material developments, this opens design opportunities for architects and designers and could be a potential solution for housing in coming decades. CNT material structural performance has been improving more than 20% year by year recently. It is anticipated that this trend is going to continue. The latest test, highly aligned CNT material forms can compete and sometimes surpass structural performance of commercially available carbon fibers. I'm convinced that these materials have a very interesting feature and could be a competitive alternative for currently available fibers. And more importantly, they could change the composite materials and their outreach in the near future. In the flatlands of Spain, Camilo Moreno at Pifortec explores the infinite lattices of graphene for their structural and electrical properties. The special thing about graphene is that uh, the bonding between the atoms of the carbon itself making, uh, making the strongest structure in the world. So the chemical surface of these materials can be attached with different compounds that, they, that are different materials like resins or concrete-like materials that are be using in main building uh, sector. A supercapacitor is an electrochemical device that uh, stores energy in a physical phenomena uh, instead of a chemical reaction that uh, you can find in another electrochemical devices like batteries, the uh, supercapacitor itself uh, store ions in the surface of a carbon electrode. Yeah, the main advantages is that you're using in buildings or uh, and infrastructure itself, energy storage in infrastructure of the supercapacitors against the lithium ion batteries are that they are mainly uh, composed by the carbon materials. Can be, uh, for getting current collectors, can be 100% full of carbon. Um, the, uh, the main advantages of that uh, is that you have high power, higher power than, the, than batteries, than lithium ion batteries, uh, more than two order of magnitude superior, and have uh, more than two two orders of magnitude uh, superior, superior uh, lifespan. You can go thousands of, of cycles without degradation due to the fact that the, that the phenomena of the energy storage is in the surface and is not in the volume and is not any chemical reaction involved in that, in that phenomena. Carbon Portal was conceived as an exhibition piece to celebrate the 
electrothermal properties of carbon, uh, as well as its structural properties. So it's just a thin, uh, long uh, a portal frame. So the car carbon is a, a, a taut structural membrane, but uh, critically it gathers energy. So uh, carbon-backed solar skins transmits energy, carbon energy wiring to graphene supercapacitors that are water-based and non-toxic. It then distributes energy to carbon nanotube radiant heaters. And so when you put power into the carbon nanotube felt, they, the nanotubes freak out and they, they radiate a, a long range you know, infrared that feels, feels like sunshine, feels wonderful. The, um, the base heating is, is carbon foam and carbon nanotube co uh, conductive heaters. So as you put power into those, again, they, they warm up. The, all, the, all the lighting, so the carbon, your carbon filament um, carbon nanotube filaments on suspension lights. The the uh, the cable down the length of the portal is carbon nanotube tape that carries energy. The swing is is carbon nanotube uh, uh, very very thin wires that that give structural support, but also provide a heated seat. The display cabinet also powered through its suspension cables. Um, the the finishes also the aesthetics of the of carbon is celebrated, so racing sail, robotic filament deployment, uh, the milled hex tool, which is a, a kind of flocked carbon nanotube surface that, that is, is used as a, a milling board, uh, the regular carbon fiber weave, uh, as well as a carbon, carbon felts, and in the leading edge, the, the thin leading edge of the portal, there's a, an LED ticker tape that announces its energy metrics. So the, the whole prospect is of a, a sentient sort of data receiving um, uh, carbon, you know, antenna. The whole the whole portal is a as a five G antenna, and so it's a it's a carbon shroud for a carbon organism, um, which is a delicious prospect. The architectural team at MIT, led by Mark Goldthorpe, has looked to defining not just the, the form that carbon architecture might take, but to think through protocols of manufacturing, thermal performance, structural performance, fire performance, and liaising with the, the eight groups of, of technical specialists in composite engineering, composite manufacturing, carbon nanotube production, life cycle analysis, energy analysis. Carbon House attempts to build really just using carbon, trying to displace all minerals and metals. And we're focusing largely on carbon nanotube, uh, also carbon foams and graphene, uh, but forms of carbon that can be obtained uh, by methane pyrolysis, by coal pyrolysis, um, as a complement to releasing hydrogen as a clean fuel. Uh, the, the ambition is to, is to use about 85% by mass of carbon in, in a building, but to ultra lightweight buildings, they suit carbon composites. Um, and I'm, I've gathered a team of eight uh, specialists in carbon nanotube production, graphene production, composite structural engineering, life cycle analysis, composite manufacture. And if you, if you look for the Carbon House uh, videos in this, um, in this gallery, you'll find uh, videos by each of the team members who are all, I think, uh, leading, leading figures in their respective fields. So look out for them. Well, curiously, I think the biggest uh, impediments are not so much technical as conceptual. I think many of the other sectors have already addressed, you know, a whole barrage of technical issues of, you know, structure, longevity, not things of aircraft, fire protection, acoustical, thermal. Um, they've all they've all been, you know, faced up to and, and resolved. Uh, I think I think more of a challenge. But particularly for architects and building engineers, 
is to just rethink completely the, the sort of ethos of buildings. You know, we, we gather load into primary structures and take it to ground, and here load is, is, is distributed. Uh, here material is sort of left in space, not put in space. Uh, the, the live loads far exceed the dead load. So you, you're holding buildings down against, against the wind. Um, you can't just, just, just punch holes where you, you want. You have to reinforce around them. Um, so it's, it's a far, it's, it's sort of worked from within as much as it's worked from without. So where traditionally architects are quite pictorial, they, they, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of poised art form of facadism and organization and a plan. I think when you when you get to a, a a monocoque of load-bearing fiber, it's almost like you you have to be thinking thinking force uh, in a far more you know, sophisticated way. Um, not that we can't, but it's it's not part of our our training as yet. This uh, final video casts uh, a vision into the future to 2061. And this was done uh, as a proposal to MIT to gather all the necessary carbon scientists and fabricators into one carbon hub uh, to tackle this problem forcefully. <laughs> Part three of MIT's 200th anniversary EarthPod series looks back at the carbon to building fab lab, the ARC as it became known, a quietly powerful CGC initiative in benign carbon habitation. Built at MIT North's Woodland Campus, before abandonment of Cambridge even, this old footage from the wet epoch shows the carbon laboratories and workshops and the progeny that emerged, the principled all carbon pilot houses, offering elegant dwelling to the researchers, more with less the mantra of the arts carbon advocates. The flat pack house, of course, adopted by FEMA and the UN, variants of the solar and helia houses by now ubiquitous globally, the filigree pre-stressed carbon Sturm house, proliferating in coastal wetlands, and the stealth house, the first example of an electrothermal building envelope a giant data antenna. In the arc, material scientists synthesized laser tunable carbon foams and pitch tars, the first variable property 3D printing. Gas pyrolysis was scaled up to yield net zero carbon nanotube fiber, cheaper than steel, yet five times stiffer, 12 times stronger, and supplementing hydrogen as the vital bridging fuel. One-step carbon nanotube consolidation, out of autoclave, out of oven compositing, all reiteratively reduced to practice here. We found the original renderings of the seminal little carbon portal, carbon as structure, energy, data, heat, aesthetics, where the idea of a carbon shroud for a carbon organism took hold, a sentient second skin. Reef and Lester's memoirs both mention the house sensing the coyotes before ever you saw them. The striking Saudi pavilion for the Ithra campus milled in the arc, utterly pivotal in reorienting hydrocarbons from fuel to benign building material. But the early carbon condos, alone left standing in the megastorms of the 30s and 40s, really the moment where the shift to a carbon ontology took hold. When the organic legacy became the essential background materiality of civilization. The recent MIT native West heliomorph, benign, lightweight, shaped for light and wind, tacitly indebted to the quiet, incremental carbon architecture that issued from the arc. <laughs>